with that maximum principle, what should I do? Uh, when, while this deliberative point of view is sort of primary, it's the fundamental case for time, where we ask, is this maxim something that I may act on? Um, this is not this kind of explicit deliberation is not the only way that we can come to adopt maxims. In fact, sometimes we, so to speak, back into that. Sometimes we um, have adopted a certain principle of action without sufficiently or explicitly reflecting on it. Um, and these, so we, so to speak, find ourselves doing something without explicitly or deliberately considering it ahead of time. Um, so we can imagine, I mean, imagine a case in which somebody um, reflects on himself and realizes suddenly with a start that um, he's treated women in a sexist way, for example. So he never consciously decided, never deliberated over this before, and said to himself, should I adopt this sexist maxim or not? There was never any awareness of this before. Um, but now, in retrospect, he sees that he has been sexist. Well, so for Kant, that, um, that person has been acting on a sexist maxim, for example. Um, and of course, he's responsible for his behavior. He's responsible for having adopted that maxim, even though there was no moment at which he explicitly decided to uh, adopt it. So the point is um, that people are responsible for their principles of action, even when they are not explicitly considered through deliberation. So deliberation is the case where Kant is primarily thinking about the adoption of maxims, and the supreme principle of morality is the test to use in that kind of deliberation, um, but he's not assuming that everybody always explicitly deliberates. So it may turn out that we have in fact adopted maxims without careful deliberation or without explicitly considering them. Okay, um, so next we get uh, Kant telling us yet again that we cannot base morality on experience. That any attempt to base, to identify the supreme principle of morality based on um, an empirical investigation is going to fail. Um, and he has two arguments here. Two arguments for why the supreme principle of morality can't be based on empirical investigation. Um, I'll, I'll just mention what these two are quickly and then find what to say in this fact. The first is, um, well, because human beings don't have such a great track record on morality to begin with. So if we're trying to have an empirical investigation of how human beings behave in order to figure out what morality requires, hmm, I'm going to be dicey. The second is what's sometimes called the problem of the criteria. And this is related. Okay, so the first one, here's the first argument. This is on page, um, uh, sorry, on pages 407 to 408, bottom of page 22. It says, one need not even be a, an enemy of virtue, but only a cold-blooded observer who does not at once take the liveliest wish for the good as, it, as its actuality, to become doubtful at certain moments whether any true virtue is actually to be found in the world at all. 
So look at how people actually treat one another. The empirical record isn't so great. But, he says, um, even if there never have been actions that have sprung from such pure sources, still, what is at issue here is not at all whether this or that does happen, whether people have been moral and good to each other or not, but that reason by itself and independently of all appearances commands what ought to happen. And hence, that actions of which the world so far has perhaps not yet given an example, genuine moral concern or moral um, acting from duty, and the feasibility of which might be very doubted, very much doubted by someone who makes experience the foundation of everything, these are still unrelentingly commanded by reason. Okay, so looking at how people actually treat each other is not going to be a very good basis for which to construct moral requirements because people often are not moral to one another. Here's the second argument over on page 23 um, at 409. Um, Sorry, 408 to 409. Um, he's saying that morality can't be generated from examples because we need to know which examples to look at. We need some way of identifying which are the exemplary cases to illustrate moral action. Uh, and we need some, what? We need some standard or some criterion on which to pick out the good ones. Um, so he says, even, um, um, sorry, just about the middle of the page, he says, even the Holy One of the Gospel, that is Jesus, uh, must be evaluated by the ideal of pure morality in order to be able to pick him out as an exemplar of what morality requires. So examples, he says, the bottom of the page, serve for encouragement only. That is, they put beyond doubt the feasibility of what the law commands, they make intuitive what the practical rule expresses more generally, but they can never entitle us to set aside their true origin, which lies in reason, and to go by examples. We need some way of <coughs> deciding which are the examples. Let's move on to 26, bottom of the page. Um, the idea of imperatives. So this is 412, very bottom of page 26. It says, everything in nature works according to laws. Um, so everything in nature, the world of experience. Only a rational being, he says, has the capacity to act according to the representation of laws. That is, according to principles or a will. Since reason is required for deriving actions from laws, the will, he says, is nothing other than practical reason. So practical reason is going to be our, is the ability to consider the reasons for or against some action. Um, and so we need a capacity to apply the laws, the reasons, to particular actions, to determine particular actions. That's what the will does. That's exactly the same thing as practical reason. If re so top, top of page 27. If reason determines the will without fail, then the actions of such a being are recognized as objectively necessary, sorry, that are recognized as objectively necessary are also subjectively necessary. That is, the will is, is a capacity to choose only that which reason, independently of inclination, recognizes as practically necessary, i.e., as good. Okay, so this is an example of a purely rational will that only, and necessarily only, acts in pursuit of what reason says to pursue. That is, in pursuit of what is objectively good. 
even, sorry, and, and there are no countervailing pressures, no temptations away from this. Um, if, however, reason all by itself does not sufficiently determine the will, if it is also subject to subjective conditions, that is, to incentives, empirical incentives, that are not always in agreement with the objective ones, then actions objectively recognized as necessary are subjectively contingent. And the determination of such a will in conformity with objective laws is necessitation. Okay, so that's us. So we have an ability to apply rules of reason to determine our action. That is, we have um, practical reason. We have a will. But we're also tempted by things that are not objectively good. We're also tempted by things which are not what, 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 what pure reason tells us to pursue. These are empirical incentives. Okay, so we have natural instincts and desires that present to us certain objects or certain ends presented to us as good. Things that we want. So they're presented to us as good, but they're not always good. They're not always objectively good. So there can be a divergence be between what we're tempted by, our empirical inclinations and drives, and what's objectively good, that is what pure reason would recommend. Is that clear? Okay. For creatures like us, then, what's objectively good, what's recommended by pure reason, is not something that we automatically go in for because we may have temptations to do something else. And so reason presents its demands to us as imperatives. So, so, so pure reason identifies what's objectively good and we uh, recognize that it makes demands on us which may be different than what we subjectively want. And often, so let me say this again, often what we subjectively want is to satisfy the inclinations that we have. That's what it means to have empirical desires. Namely, we want to satisfy that. That is, they present themselves to us as good, whether they are objectively good or not. They present themselves to us as subject. And so there can be a divergence between what's subjectively good and what's objectively good, and what's objectively good, determined by reason, presents itself to us as demands, as requirements, as imperatives. Um, so, in other words, a perfect, so you're just talking about us, those of us who uh, have empirical desires that present ends to us as good, even independently of what reason says. 